So I want to talk to you today about our, our recent studies on human papillomaviruses and the DNA damage response, which is a normal response of cells to uh, uh, repair lesions introduced by uh, external stimuli. So the people that have done the work are, uh, I should talk about them first, is Kavi Mehta, a very talented graduate student in my lab, and then a series of postdoctoral fellows, Vignesh Gunasakarian, uh, Ayano Satsuka, Carrie Moody, who started this work and then moved to her own lab at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, and then Ryan Hong. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time uh, talking about human papillomaviruses because I'm sure you're all familiar with, with Lawrence wor Lawrence's work. But just for those few people who don't know about them, they're small DNA tumor viruses, only 8,000 base pairs in size, so the genomes are very restricted. There's over 200 different types, of which a third infect the genital tract, and these are sexually transmitted viral infections. And in fact, these are the most common sexually transmitted viral infection. About two-thirds of young adults acquire HPV infection during the first two years of, eight of sexual activity. Almost everybody clears it except for a small number of women who become persistently infected, and these are the women that have a high risk for development of cervical cancer. The viral infections in the genital tract come in two kinds. These are called the low-risk types because they're low risk for progression to uh, uh, genital cancers. And there's about 10 HPV types, 16, 18, 31 are examples of these, that are the high-risk HPV types that are associated with the development of cervical carcinoma. All these genomes have similar, all these viral types have similar genomes, double-stranded circular DNAs, about eight kilobases in size, divided into three regions. One's called the upstream regulatory region, which contains all the sequences to regulate viral expression, as well as the origin of replication right here. Then you have a series of open reading frames. They're all open reading frames are transcribed from a single strand of the double-stranded genome. And the ones that are designated E are the ones that are uh, transcribed and synthesized prior to productive replication. E6 and E7 are the two oncoproteins of the virus. E6 targets P53. E7 targets the retinoblastoma proteins. And these two proteins are selectively retained and expressed in all genital malignancies induced by HPV. There are two replication proteins, E1 and E2 which recognize the origin of replication. E1 also acts as a helicase and also then acts to recruit cellular enzymes to replicate the genome. There are no polymerases. There are no single-stranded binding proteins. There are none of the accessory proteins uh, that are necessary for replication that are encoded by the virus because the virus uses the cellular machinery to replicate its genomes. There are two minor proteins, E4 and E5, that are associated with the late phase of the virus life cycle. And then there are two capsid proteins encoded by the virus. L1 is the major one. This is the one that's expressed in yeast or in baclovirus systems and forms the basis of the prophylactic vaccine. L2 is the auxiliary protein that's necessary for infection. So these viruses infect human epithelial cells. And the process that's really fascinated me for the last 20 years has been the life cycle of these viruses and their linkage to the differentiation program of a particular organ. So most of the viruses that we study, like HIV, herpes, uh, influenza, all those viruses infect a target cell. And within a short period of time, probably 72 hours, they're making progeny viruses from those same infected cells. So HPV is one of a small group of viruses that link the production of progeny virions to the differentiation of an organ. So, an, and this is the squamous epithelia. So a normal squamous epithelia is about 30 layers thick, of which cells in the basal layer are the only ones actively dividing. These are the stem cells and the post-stem cells called transit amplifying cells that make up the bulk of the epithelia. And when these cells divide, one of the daughter cells remains in the basal layer and the other daughter cell is pushed upwards. And as it leaves the basal layer, it immediately exits the cell cycle. And then as it migrates upwards, as it gets about two thirds of the way up, in most epithelia, the nuclei are degraded so that the, at the very top of the epithelium are just bags of keratin. That's what we have right here on our, on our hands on cutaneous tissue. So HPVs <coughs> enter into the cells in the basal layer that become exposed through micro wounds. They travel down the micro wound.
attach to the cell surface, migrate to the nucleus, and establish their genomes as episomal copies, extra chromosomal elements, at about 100 copies per cell. When this cell divides, the viral DNA is replicated coordinately with cellular replication, and the viral genomes are then distributed equally between the two daughter cells so that the viral DNA is, main is maintained in the basal layer as well as in the cell that's pushed upwards away from the basal layer. The major change that HPV induces in these cells is it blocks the normal cell cycle exit. So instead of exiting the cell cycle, the cells become locked in G1, and the nuclei are no longer degraded. And when they reach the very top of the epithelium, viral proteins push the cells to into S phase and into G2, where the viral DNA is replicated because it uses all the cellular enzymes to replicate viral genomes. And then you have the production of virions and the release of these pro progeny virions to the outside world. In this way, cells in the basal layer can remain infected and persist in the synthesis of, uh, of, of, of viral progeny for extended periods of time or until the immune system happens to come by and finally recognize the HPV positive cells and clear them in a normal infection. These are also the cells where the viral carcinomas, virally induced carcinomas originate and they propagate and take over the epithelium. So here's a biopsy of an HPV-16 positive patient, cervical biopsy. And what we've done here is done in situ hybridization, and this is using the black as an indicator of viral genomes. And so you can see this is the basal layer down here, and there's very low copies of episomes down here. But as you differentiate, you can see there's viral genome production at the very top of the epithelium. And I call your attention to this cell right here, which is a really characteristic morphology that appears in an HPV infection. There's a densely staining chromatin pushed to one side with a vacuole around that chromatin. And this is the basis of the pap smear, where you take cells from the surface of the cervix and plate them onto a, a glass slide and examine those cells for that morphology. So almost everybody is infected with these viruses, but the lesions are very small. They're smaller than a pinhead. But once that lesion grows and becomes greater than a centimeter in diameter, the chance of it becoming a cancer is about 50%. So at that stage, you should treat it. So what you're doing in a pap smear is counting the number of virally infected cells and, and, and indicating whether there should be further follow-up of these cells. If you look inside of those cells that I just showed you, you can see there's that vacuole around the nucleus densely staining chromatin, and inside you see these little viral particles lining up, ready to be released to the outside world. So this process of what controls the differentiation-dependent life cycle is what I've really focused on in the last, uh, last decade or so. And so for this, we need several systems to look at differentiation in the laboratory. These viruses only grow in human keratinocytes. They don't grow in mouse keratinocytes. They don't grow in mouse fibroblasts. So we use uh, foreskin circumcisions as our source of primary keratinocytes, as well as cervical cells from optional hysterectomies as our, uh, uh, hysterectomies as our source of cells. So we take these, uh, these tissues, uh, dice them up, and into those cells, that are proliferating, the proliferate basal cells, we grow them first as submerged monolayer cultures. And we introduce HPV DNA by either transfection or isolated from a biopsy specimen. And then we, to induce the differentiation life cycle, we plate them onto a smaller dish that has a layer of collagen <coughs> into which we have embedded fibroblasts. So the fibroblasts are essential. So this mimics the stroma in, under, in epithelia that gives structural support to the epithelium as well as provides growth factors for the proper differentiation of these cells. So when these cells now become confluent, we then scoop them out of a submerged culture and place them onto a small wire platform that's about a quarter of a centimeter high and that has holes in it so that media can diffuse and place that whole platform into another dish where we add the media up to the bottom of the dish. 
So now the cells, instead of growing sideways as they do in submerged cultures, they stratify and differentiate over a period of two weeks. And it's very faithful differentiation. Then we harvest these cultures, fix them, and do paraffin cross-sections and examine them by histology. So here you can see cells from the same host. This is the collagen plug grown in raft cultures, grown in <clears throat> this is the collagen plug. These are, this is the basal layer. And you can see as you differentiate, you lose nuclei. And this is the keratinized region. So these are the same cells or match sets of the cells that we've introduced HPV, in this case, HPV 31. And it's in episomal form. You can see the nuclei are retained throughout all the layers. And in this layer, you can see these vacuoles appearing. And this is where the viral DNA is replicated. The reason we study HPV 31, which is not the most common HPV type in cervical cancers rather than 16 and 18, is because it was the first virus that we grew in tissue culture using a biopsy-derived cell line. And subsequently, it's become apparent to us that it's the most easily manipulable viral type to study the life cycle in tissue culture. It really maintains itself as an episome uh, in, in these cultures for extended decades of time, while the hi more highly oncogenic types tend to integrate more rapidly. So if we're focusing on the life cycle, we've chosen to do many of our studies in HPV-16. But what's true for HPV-16 is true for all the oncogenic types. So then if we take these cross-sections and stain them with some antibodies <laughs> by immunohistochemistry, here's the cross-section right here of the RAF culture with had HPV sequences. This is the, the bottom layer. You can see that it stratifies here with a, just a, a blue counter stain. Here we've stained with a marker for differentiation called filagrin, which is a keratin filament associated protein. So HPV only slightly modifies differentiation. It doesn't totally abrogate it. And it's sort of interesting. It allows cells to remain in the cell cycle, active in the cell cycle, yet the cells still uh, exhibit markers of differentiation. This is one of the most highly expressed viral proteins here, the E4 protein, which is only expressed in the late phases of the productive phase of the viral life cycle. <clears throat> and in a subset of those cells, you have the capsid antibodies to the capsid protein. So interestingly, not all cells make virus, but there's a significant number of cells that are making large amounts of virus. And if you look inside of those cells, you can see viral particles that are infectious, and you can grow in a, in a, in a, in a, in a naive culture. But the titers are very low, so we, we don't often do infection studies. We m more often introduce HPV genomes, especially mutant HPV genomes, uh, by transfection. So that's a beautiful system for inducing differentiation. But what we'd like to do is to take each of those layers and isolate them. We'd like to take a razor blade and cut each of the differentiating layers and find out what proteins are expressed at what level of differentiation. Impossible to do. So what we do instead is we found another system that induces differentiation. And it's a very, very simple system where we just change the calcium concentration. Changes in calcium concentration are one of many signals that induce differentiation. But in our hands, it's the, uh, sufficient to induce the productive phase of the viral life cycle. So I show that over here on the right panel. You can see these cells. And the great thing about this is all the cells coordinately differentiate as a function of time. So if you take and isolate the cells after 24 hours or 48 hours, you have homogeneous populations of cells that express uniformly differentiated cells. So you can see that right here. So here you start with keratin 10. There's really no expression in undifferentiated cells. As you differentiate, you get a lot of expression. Involucrin, another marker of differentiation, occurs upon differentiation. And on the left-hand side, this is a southern blot of a cell that has of cells that have HPV episomes that we've induced to differentiate. And you can see that as you differentiate, you induce this process of productive replication, or a process we call amplification. And this is then followed by the synthesis of capsid proteins, assembly of virions, and <coughs> release to the outside. So we've used these systems to study the linkage or the mechanisms that control the viral life cycle. And surprisingly, we found an intimate uh, linkage between the DNA damage pathways and the productive phase of the viral life cycle. 
So in normal cells, what happens if you get cell, expose them to UV or some sort of ionizing radiation and you is, induce double-stranded or single-stranded breaks, these are recognized by a complex of proteins that consist of RAD50, MRE11, NBS1, recognize this double-stranded break, and then recruit the ataxia telegentia kinase called ATM to these sites, leading to its autophosphorylation. And the ATM kinase is the critical regulator of pathways that induce the repair of these genomes. One of these pathways is through P53, but as you know, E6 causes the rapid degradation, high-risk E6 causes the rapid degradation of P53. So this pathway is not very active in HPV-positive cells. The more, more common pathway is through this kinase called CHECK2, which induces phosphorylation of CDC25. It induces a S and G2 phase arrest, where you get repair of these genomes by uh, a recombination-dependent repair mechanism in G2. There's a related kinase called ATR, which repairs single-stranded breaks, and I won't talk very much about that, but we also find that's important for HPV replication. Also important is there's a specific kind of histone that's called H2AX that becomes phosphorylated and recruited to sites of double-stranded breaks. So these surround the sites and open and prepare the DNA for repair by repair polymerases. So Carrie Moody, when she was in my lab, just did a very simple experiment and just looked at matched cells that have HPV31 episomes at the same passage with cells that are derived from a foreskin keratin, the same host. And you can see that while the ATM levels are similar in both sets of cells, maybe a little higher in HPV positive cells, the, the active or phosphorylated form, the phospho ATM, is really present primarily in the HPV positive cells. There's no exposure to any sort of ionizing radiation or anything, so they're just constitutively active. More, uh, more impressive is if you look at the downstream players of these. That's the CHECK2. You can see the phospho CHECK2 is active only in the HPV positive cells, not, and the, these are cells that are induced to differentiate, not in the normal keratinocytes, as well as phospho NBS1, which is one of those members of, the, of that recognition complex, but also plays a role in recombination dependent repair in G2. And that's present only upon differentiation, one of three factors that we find only turned on upon differentiation. BRCA1 is also activated in these cells. And here's CHECK1, which I, I said before, is also activated only in HPV positive cells. So it turns out that HPV turns on this pathway without any sort of external stimulus. To look at this in detail, and I need to show you a drug that we use to take advantage of, which is an, an ATM-specific inhibitor called KU55933, which is called KUDOS. And you can see if you add this drug, it inhibits the phosphorylation of CHECK2 and phosphorylation of ATM, but no effect on the total levels of these proteins or the phosphorylation of CHECK1. There's, for adenoviruses, also seem to target the ATM DNA damage response, but instead of activating it, they have to suppress it, and that's because adenoviruses replicate by linear, uh, through linear molecules, but in HPV-positive cells, the cells that are targeted in adenovirus infections are really not changed. That's MRE11 and RAD50. So those are Western blots, but what happens, in, in, in probably in a more dramatic way to, to visualize this response, is to look at the the, the presence of these proteins by immunofluorescence. In normal cells, when you damage these damaged cells, you induce the, repair, uh, the, the formation of foci of these replication repair uh, proteins. And these are the sites of repair. So repair doesn't occur all throughout the nucleus. It occurs in defined locations. And so we looked into these cells by uh, HPV positive cells to see if they also form foci. So in the top panel, two panels, you see normal foreskin keratinocytes, differentiated keratinocytes, and there's really no staining of any significant levels. But if you look in HPV31 positive cells, you see the formation of these little dots of CHECK2, as well as upon differentiation, the formation of dots with this 
histone H2AX, and you see that the nuclei get larger in the HPV positive cells. So these are forming in, 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 in foci reminiscent, reminiscent of repair foci in normal cells. And if you treat these cells with the drug inhibitor of the ATM kinase, you block the formation of these foci and you, have, you modify the appearance of the H2X foci. So this also happens in RAF cultures. So these are cross sections and it's in black uh, a background just to show you the, the staining. So this is DAPI for the nuclei and we stain for phosphocheck 2 You can see it's distributed throughout all the layers as we saw in the calcium induced differentiation. And in the HFKs, the normal cells, there's really no turning on of this of these signals. Similarly, I showed you that there's a dramatic increase in the level of the activated histone, H2AX, only in the differentiated cells. So here's the bottom of the raft, here's the top of the raft, and this, the, this is where the viral amplification is taking place. And you can see the turn on of the H2AX histone specifically in the differentiated cells. There's low levels down here, but there's much more dramatic levels up here. So what I've shown you is that there's, there's turn on of this pathway, but does it really have any effect on viral amplification or replication? So first we looked at undifferentiated cells, and this is the stable replication of viral episomes through multiple passages. So this is eight, uh, <coughs> up to 10 passages in the presence of, of, this, uh, 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 of this inhibitor right here. You can see these are match sets and there's really no change in the replication in undifferentiated cells, even if the cells are grown for a long period of time. In contrast, if you look at what happens upon differentiation, so here's the normal episomal amplification going from this copy number to this copy number upon, upon 48 hours and 96 hours. If you add the drug, you get no increase upon differentiation. It stays at the same level as undifferentiated cells at either of these two concentrations. And it's a direct effect on replication. It's not an indirect effect of uh, differentiation because these cells are all um, expressing markers of differentiation just like their, nor uh, their uh, untreated counterparts, the DMSO control counterparts. This is Im impressive, but I think it looks more interesting when we look by in situ hybridization of all the HPV um, DNA. <clears throat> so here we have undifferentiated cells, and this is the DAPI stain, so you can see where the nuclei are. So this is 100 copies of HPV DNA. Instead of being spread out all through the nucleus, it's really confined in one dot or maybe two dots. And I want you just to remember that when I come back to, uh, when I talk about SMC1 a little bit later on, about what SMC1 might be doing. If you amplify now, what you see is first the appearance of multiple dots spread throughout the nucleus and maybe even associated more with the nuclear lamina. And then if you wait even longer times, these multiple dots fuse into one large dot that becomes a viral replication factory and that's where you have the synthesis of virions. And if you now treat these amplifying cells, these differentiating cells with this drug that inhibits the ATM response, you go back to the situation here. So I think this is pretty convincing evidence that the ATM pathway plays a role in the productive replication of the virus. So what I've shown you so far is a bunch of dots that correspond to activation of ATM factors. And I've shown you a bunch of dots that correspond to replicating HPV genomes. Are these the same dots? So what we've done here is we've taken the same set of cells and first performed FISH for HPV DNA. And onto those same cells, we've then treated them with reagents and performed immunohistochemistry on the same cells. So here you can see the green dots of HPV DNA. These are for that histone H2AX. And here you can see that they overlap completely. So, and if we were to do this with check two, you'd see the same thing, ATM. They're all together. They're merged on complexes in the same uh, regions of the viral, of, of the virally infected nuclei. And in fact, they are all localized to HPV DNA on these, uh, in these nuclei. So, but what we've done here is chip analysis, and we've done chip for this, in this case, the gamma H2AX. So in undifferentiated cells, there's low levels 
of H2AX binding. And as you differentiate, as we showed before, the levels of H2AX dramatically increase, and the binding to HPV genomes goes up as you differentiate. So the ATM factors are recruited to these sites of, uh, uh, of repair or replication of HPV genomes and are, in fact, functioning and important for the viral amplification. So what could these factors be doing? Uh, let me talk to you about another factor that we find to be important in this process, and then maybe I can join everything together at the end and talk about how we believe that this is part of the repair, uh, recombination repair arm of the ATM DNA damage response that's working in G2. But let me talk to you a little bit about structural maintenance proteins. Now, these are the chromosome organizers in cells. And we all know these as the condensins, which are SMC2 and 4, and the cohesins, SMC1 and 3. So the condensins act to collapse chromosomes prior to mitosis. Uh, the condensins do, and the cohesins hold the sister chromatids together prior to mitosis so that they can undergo repair, recombination repair, as well as align themselves for proper segregation into the two daughter cells. So that's what normal SMC1 and SMC3, SMC4 proteins do in the cell. But SMC1 has another function, and that's associated with the phosphorylated form of, of SMC, and that helps to recruit ATM DNA damage factors to sites of DNA, uh, DNA damage. And you can see that in this cartoon here. I don't know if you can't, I mean, it's a little bit out of focus, but uh, wherever my arrow went to, there it is. Here you can see SMC1 right here. It acts as the nucleus to recruit all these BRCA1, NBS1, ATM, all these factors that act in repair. And when these assemble, then they recruit repair polymerases, and they start to resect the DNA a little bit, and then fill it in by replication. But the active form is the phosphorylated form of SMC1, the active form in the DNA damage pathway. So first we looked in HPV-positive cells. This is normal keratinocytes, and this is one of our lines for HPV-positive cells. And you can see that the levels of total SMC1 are increased in these cells. And more significantly, the active form is also present in these HPV-positive cells. As you differentiate normal foreskin keratinocytes, there's really no activation of the phosphorylated form. In HPV-positive cells, there's high levels throughout un in undifferentiated and differentiated cells. And visually, again, it's the same thing. These factors all assemble into foci. So here are undifferentiated and differentiated uh, normal foreskin keratinocytes stained for uh, SM phospho-SMC1. And here you can see in HPV-positive cells, low number of, of, of dots, a little more than the number of episomes. And then when you differentiate, you get a large number of jackpot cells that have a ton of these uh, foci. If you quantitate this, you can see this down here. This is, again, the same experiment. Looking at the differences, you, the number of uh, puncta dramatically increases upon differentiation. So these puncta all co-localize with other members of the ATM DNA damage response, not surprising, like phospho check 2. Here we've done immunohistochemistry for phospho SMC1, phospho check 2, and you can see they all co-localize in differentiating cells. They co-localize, but we wondered if they formed complexes. And this is sort of the easy man's way of doing it, uh, an immunoprecipitation. Sometimes co-immunoprecipitations co are difficult to do and challenging. So we took, in fact, a more uh, uh, um, imaging-related approach using an assay called proximity ligation, or co uh, on-slide co-immunoprecipitation, I think the company that we bought the kit from. So what it takes advantage of is antibodies from two different species. And so that the secondary antibodies have attached to their ends short oligos that if they are in pro close proximity, they can hybridize and form a primer to induce rolling circle replication. And if you induce a floor, you can see the floor as an indicator of, uh, of, of that these proteins are very close together. 
So a, spot, a red spot indicates that there is uh, a signal, uh, the lack of a spot signals that there isn't anything. So these are HPV positive, negative cells, and I think that's just a background staining right here because you can look in HPV positive cells that there's a dramatic increase in the number of spots here between gamma H2AX and phospho SMC1 as well as phospho CHECK2 and phospho SMC1. So we conclude from this are that these proteins form complexes in these cells and that these complexes are loca localized to those repair or replication foci that we had seen previously. So SMC1 is an essential protein. In other words, cells are not viable if you knock them out completely with SHRNAs. So the best we were able to do was in a short-term assay was to knock down the levels of SMC1 by 50%. You can see that in this, uh, this quantitation of the, of the intensity. But interestingly enough, even though we just knocked down SMC1 by 50%, we were able to completely block the ability of these, these cells remain viable <coughs> to amplify the cells upon differentiation. So it says that SMC1 is important for HPV amplification. So next we wanted to understand more how SMC1 interacted with the viral genomes. And we noted that many of the SMC1 uh, interacting partners and the way that SMC1 in many cases, but not all cases, is recruited to various kinds of DNAs is through its interactions with a factor called CTCF. So this is a factor that binds a defined set of sequences, these CCTC motifs. And what these are, have been initially characterized as are insulator proteins. These are proteins that are often found at the ends of enhancer domains. And what they do is they act to form loops between chromosomal DNA. You know, chromosomal DNA isn't just a linear string all through the genome. It's <coughs> tied up in knots. And what brings these knots together are CTCF proteins in complex with SMC1. And these are also involved in things like VDJ joining as well as recombination repair. So it's been reported that SMC1 is, is a binding partner to CTCF. So we looked for CTCF sites first in the HPV31 genome, and we found five sites, uh, three in L2. And these are the canonical CTCF sites, the ones, the initial ones that were identified in a chicken gene were equally spaced apart. And so we focused on these three sites in our studies. But there's two other sites in the L2, L1 open reading frame and one in e, E2. The reason we're really attracted to this factor is that all HPV types have these CTCF sites somewhere in the late regions, either in L2. So 85% of them have sequences in L2. Some have it in E2 some in E2, E4, and some in L1. And these are the canonical sites. There are also non-canonical sites where CTCF binds. So we're pretty sure that there are HPV SMC1 binding sites throughout the genome. So first we looked at, see, saw if this was <coughs> something that, that, that was, <coughs> that SMC1 was interacting with CTCF. And we used our on-slide co-immunoprecipitation assay that I described before. So in normal foreskin keratinocytes, really just background signals. But in HPV positive cells, you can see that there's there complex formation between these two, uh, two proteins in HPV positive cells. So they seem to be forming complexes. The next thing we did is we knocked down CTCF. And not surprisingly, CTCF is, again, uh, uh, an essential protein. So you can't get rid of it completely. But I, first, I show you that. In normal foreskin keratinocytes, CTCF goes down, goes down as you differentiate. In HPV-positive cells, it remains at high levels. Here you can see that we're able to knock down CTCF about <coughs> 60 or 70 percent, but not totally, and that's quantified over here. And that was sufficient to block productive amplification. So we were able to block amplification by either blocking SMC1 or blocking CTCF. But we, want, but we couldn't establish permanent cell lines in which CTCF was stably knocked down. So we took another approach to try to mutate the sites in HPV <coughs> where these factors bound. And first, let me show you some chip data showing you that um, this is the L2 region that has the three canonical 
CTCF binding sites. And this is the upstream regulatory region of the viral genome right here. And what I show you down here is that there's really no binding of SMC1, and I'll show you in a second that CTCF also doesn't bind here, either in undifferentiated and differentiated cells. SMC1 only seems to bind to the L2 motif in, these, in the late region. And this is also where you see uh, gamma H2X that increases dramatically upon differentiation. But we think that gamma H2X is spread out through the entire genome, while SMC1 and CTCF are focused at the L2 region. So since we couldn't knock down CTCF and establish a cell line, what we did next was mutate those three canonical sites to non-CTCF binding sites. And you can see that right here. This is a chip in the L2 region. You can see that, uh, that, uh, that SMC1 and CTCF bind this region. When we make these mutations, we lose the binding either at one, the, the Im passage immediately after transfection or the following passage. Then we had an incredibly surprising result, something I never expected. I always thought the, the L2 region was very silent in HPV genomes, and you could just delete it and nothing would happen. Much to our surprise, when we first mutated these sites, and we did this multiple times, first of all, we noted that, that the cells grew much slower. So these are, this is a wild-type colony after about a week after transfection, and these are colonies with the mutant genome. They're very small and growing very slowly. And next thing that we saw was that these mutants, uh, these genomes with these mutant genomes no longer maintained episomes, but everything was integrated into the host, cr host chromosome. This is the integrated band. This is transfected at the same time with viral, uh, wild-type viral genomes, and you can see that they're still maintained episomally. So mutating these sites screwed things up tremendously. First of all, the, the cells had difficulty growing. Eventually, they took off and it became uh, normal growing. But in that initial phase, they were very, very slow. And they failed to maintain episomes. So we were a little confused initially how this could be taking place. But then we thought that maybe these are important elements for organizing HPV 3D chromatin structure. And that's what we're looking at right now. We believe that these sites are involved in either looping of DNA to other HPV genomes or to host chromosomes in addition to their role in DNA repair. So what I've shown you in this, this, this part of the talk is that we found that there's uh, the cohesin protein, phosphosmc one is necessary for HPV genome amplification, that phosphosmc one forms complexes with members of the ATM DNA damage response, and it binds specifically to HPV genomes through CTCF sites that are located in L2, and that this is important for amplification as well as for the maintenance of genomes. And we believe that this plays a role in maintenance uh, in, in, the, in the DNA repair pathway by bringing together viral genomes through recombination repair mechanisms in G2. That's when recombination repair works, and that's what cohesin normally does, is bring these chromosomes together. And it also plays a role in the three-dimensional structure, we believe, and that's what we're testing right now, of HPV genomes in undifferentiating cells, and perhaps how they associate with cellular chromosomes. <clears throat> I'm going to close out today trying to uh, understand how this pathway is turned on in HPV positive cells. And what I've shown, it, we've shown in other studies and other labs have shown as well that expression of two of the viral proteins by itself, E7 or E1, can turn on this pathway without any of the other viral proteins. So we wanted to figure out how this was, was working. And I had two postdocs working in the laboratory one working on the innate immune response of, of HPV and how HPV activated and suppressed this, and another post on working on the DNA damage pathway. And they decided to come together and they f identified an important link between the innate immune response and the DNA damage pathway. And so one of the factors that we've been looking at are Jack, the JAK-STAT pathway. And studies published probably three or four years ago, we showed that STAT1 is suppressed, actively suppressed by HPV proteins, and that's necessary to maintain episomes. So we look at other members of the JAK-STAT pathway, and we focused on STAT5, and STAT5 is like 
STAT1. You can see STAT1 over here, which is activated by interferon gamma, interferon alpha, beta, functions through a series of kinases to phosphorylate the inactive STAT proteins in the cytoplasm. When they become phosphorylated, they form homodimers and they migrate to the nucleus to turn on expression of a whole series of genes involved in cell cycle arrest. <coughs> STAT5 works in a similar manner, but turns on a different set of genes. It's turned on by cytokines, growth factors, and interferon. Again, STAT5 is inert in the cytoplasm. It becomes phosphorylated, migrates to the nucleus, and turns on a whole series of genes. Ryan Hong first noted that in HPV-positive cells, there is really minor changes in the total level of STAT5 protein, but the active form is constitutively induced in HPV positive cells and not in HPV negative cells. And this activation is maintained throughout differentiation. So here you see phosphostat 5 in, un, in, in normal foreskin keratinocytes as you differentiate. And these are two sets of lines showing that it's active throughout all stages of differentiation. So there's two isoforms. STAT 5B seems to be the primary one that maybe is, uh, STAT 5A is the one that's primarily turned on in HPV positive cells. But the most important piece of data is when we take an inhibitor of the JAK of, of STAT 5, which is called pimazide, which inhibits the phosphorylation of STAT 5, <coughs> or another drug called lestautinib, which inhibits the kinase that phosphorylates JAK 5, STAT 5, and we look at the ability of these cells to amplify viral DNA. So this is a southern blot showing what <laughs> happens in, the, in just a vehicle alone. Here, if we treat with a STAT5 inhibitor, we block amplification. And if we treat with the inhibitor of the kinase that phosphorylates STAT5, we see the same thing. So STAT5 seems to be an important regulator of HPV genome amplification. And this is where my two postdocs got together and said, let's combine our two areas of study and see if these two pathways are somehow linked. So here you can see right here, we then treated cells with the inhibitor of the STAT5 pathway, pimazide, and we looked for, first of all, STAT5. You can see it's inhibited right there, but the protein levels are unchanged. But more importantly, if you look at phospho ATM, you can see that it's completely blocked in phosphorylation. No change in the levels of ATM, blockage of check 2 phosphorylation. <clears throat> so there's a linkage between the activation of this JAK-STAT family member and the turning on of the ATM DNA damage response. So this is not so unusual because there are <clears throat> uh, cancer cells that have a mutated STAT5 protein that's constitutively active, and in those cells you have a constitutively activated <coughs> DNA damage response. So it's all, all, all consistent. But we have a bit of a conundrum in the sense that STAT5 is a transcription factor, and we're talking about the phosphorylation status of members of the ATM DNA damage pathway. So how do these factors work? One missing link, though it doesn't explain it totally, is an acetyltransferase called TIP60. So TIP60 is required to acetylate ATM before it can be autophosphorylated. And what we found is, again, treatment with pimazide blocks the activation of TIP60 by phosphorylation, which then prevents, and I don't have that, 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 that slide here, prevents the activation of the ATM kinase. But again, this is phosphorylation. We know what the kinase is. It's GSK3 beta but we still don't know how the transcription factor acts to turn on the kinase, and we're looking at that <coughs> in detail. So where we are is we have HPV activates a transcription factor. I haven't yet excluded the possibility that HPV activates a DNA damage in cells, and that leads to the phosphorylation of STAT5. But what we know is that there's a transcription factor in the JAK-STAT pathway that's turned on and that this activation is necessary for the amplification of viral DNA, and that this is mediated in part through this kinase called GSK3 beta. <clears throat> so I'll close out with just a small piece of new data that we have. We asked a very basic question. Does HPV induce DNA damage in these cells? Um, 
And the way that we do this is using a T4 DNA ligase assay. So we take cells and lightly fix them, HPV positive cells that, are amp that have been induced to differentiate, as well as normal cells that have been induced to differentiate, lightly fix them and induce, in, infuse, uh, uh, cause the diffusion of T4 DNA ligase as well as a hairpin loop structure that has attached to it a biotin tag. <clears throat> so T4 DNA ligase will specifically label sites of double-stranded breaks. And so it, what happens is that the T4 DNA ligase in the presence of ATP will attach and then you will be able, through the addition of streptavidin, <clears throat> FITSI, to be able to see if there really are sites of double-stranded breaks. So here we've done this with HPV positive cells and HPV negative cells. So here on the top two panels, these are HPV positive cell, uh, HPV negative cells, HFKs, and then HFKs treated with the inhibitor KU55933. So this is blocking the ability to repair. So you don't want the repair to be taking place while you're testing for breaks. <clears throat> and what I can tell you is there really is no signal that's indicative of any sort of breaks in the DNA. So down here we have HPV positive cells, and there's a light background of signal that suggests maybe there's some DNA breaks being induced. But if you add the inhibitor, all the cells explode. They're all richly positive for DNA damage. So HPV, by a mechanism we're not totally sure of, but I can speculate for you, uh, is inducing breaks probably because of the intensity of the signal, not only in viral DNA, but in chromosomal DNA, and that the ATM pathway is quickly repairing that, and that's functioning to help repair, repair and replicate the viral genomes. And so now we're looking at the particular viral proteins that are responsible. The E1 protein is able to turn on this pathway, and the way that it's been postulated by Mart Ustoff is that it acts to start DNA replication from origins in the cellular chromosome that look like viral origins but really aren't. And so what happens is you start replication, but they quickly stall. They run into to, to replication fork, uh, re colliding replication forks, and that causes double-stranded breaks. It, it could be that, that that's the pathway. It could also be that the E7 protein, which is also able to activate this pathway through release of E2F, is somehow inducing damage in cells. And that's where we're looking at right now. But I still think there's an interesting linkage that we have to fill in. We know that now HPV proteins cause double-stranded breaks in cells, and we know that there's a transcription factor that's a central activator of the pathway. We have to bring it together how these two factors are linked to understand how HPV functions uh, to turn on these pathways. So HPVs activate these DNA damage repair pathways, and they have to do this because they also induce uh, D, uh, DNA breaks, and the question arises, this is a repair pathway. This fixes lesions. But if you look at cervical cancers, they're tremendously aneuploid. They have all sorts of mutations. So, so how do you reconcile the fact that HPVs turn on this pathway for the productive replication of the virus, yet cancers have all these mutations in them? And I guess the hypothesis that we're testing is that HPV turns on this pathway full blast, and that what you do is during the course of a pre-malignant lesion when you're making, uh, making viral particles is you start selecting for mutations in this pathway. And those are the ones that acquire mutations. Those are the ones that go on to become cancers. And so one of the more frequently secondary, frequently mutated genes in cervical cancers are members of the ATM DNA damage pathway. But that's a hypothesis, and I think we still have to look at that in detail. But I think we've also found an interesting linkage between an innate immune regulator and the activation of this pathway, but we still have to link all the individual steps together. And so I think there's still some way to go in understanding how HPV manipulates the DNA damage pathway for the productive replication of the virus. So thank you, and I'd be happy to uh, answer any questions.